everyone. Uh, welcome this evening on September 17th. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, and I think it might be quite a few, my name is Shannon Jackson, and I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design here at Berkeley. And what that essentially is, is sort of glue function <laughs> amongst all of the different creative departments, institutes, centers, museums, uh, student clubs here at UC Berkeley. The effort here is to synchronize and foster collaboration amongst a range of creative uh, entities and organizations. Um, also to, to, to show the role of creativity in um, centers and institutes that might have a whole lot of other um, goals and values. Um, the role of arts and climate, the role of arts in technology, the role of arts and aging. Uh, and it is uh, one of the many different programs we put together in the educational realm, in student life realm, but also in public research is this series, Arts Plus Design Mondays. It's co-curated with a range of department centers, institutes all throughout the campus who work together with me and my staff to conceive a series that brings in the people and the ideas that most compel the Berkeley faculty, our students, and our alumni. Uh, so tonight, it is um, a thrill to be welcoming you here, um, especially to be doing so um, working with one of our um, beloved partners, the Osher Lifelong Living Institute. Um, tonight's uh, event is uh, thanks to the incredible sense of connection and vision of its director, Susan Hoffman, an extraordinary creative herself. And I want to thank Susan for all that you do, including tonight. Uh, as you probably see, uh, as you might see, that part of what we decided to do in putting together this series, and we welcome you back um, other Monday nights, is to focus on a, a central theme, albeit one that touches a lot of different disciplines. And this year's theme is fact and fiction, where we're thinking about uh, the distinctions, but also the, sometimes the lack of distinction amongst um, the real and the artificial fact and fiction, um, uh, uh, what we think is imagination and what we think is artifice. Um, also in this era at the moment, the idea of the fact <laughs> has become volatile in a certain way. Uh, and that you'll see a lot of uh, discussions that think about the hazards actually of this blurring, okay? But we can also think about the productivity of the blurring sometimes. Um, and I think that we'll get a chance to do a little bit of that with our speaker tonight. As many of you know, Dominic Campbell um, is here to help us explore these kinds of themes in a way that uses um, his innovative work on aging, creativity, and tonight, celebration. Dominic Campbell is co-founder of Creative Aging International, an organization that works collaboratively to create innovative programs that positively transform how we understand aging as individuals, as artists, as companies, as governments, and as societies. Founder of the Bailtain Festival, Ireland's month-long nationwide festival celebrating positive aging, which some of you may have attended, Campbell has gone on to employ collective encounters worldwide to disrupt, that's a Silicon Valley term, to disrupt and reimagine what aging means to us. He's currently an inaugural fellow um, with um, uh, an Atlantic fellow for equity and brain health at the Brain Global Brain Health Institute. And he'll be promoting tonight, as he does throughout a lot of his practice, celebration as a transformational strategy in the events he produces and in the themes that he sounds and airs with us. In numerous interviews and talks, Campbell has highlighted the role, too, of environmental, structural, and social factors, influencing both our experiences of aging and our attitudes toward it. I like this quote where he says, aging isn't simply chronology. It's a result of the years, of the way years are lived. Just as importantly, he emphasizes the role that those attitudes, the role of those attitudes and their relationship to story, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and the ones that others tell us. He says, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and the ones told by us by others, we become the old we have in our mind's eye. 
So it often seems to me that fiction in Campbell's world is not necessarily the opposite of fact, but the means by which we make and remake um, a productive reality, potentially remake and um, make a world um, of health and well-being. For Campbell, it takes creativity and collaboration for these stories um, to foster deep change. And I think tonight, he'll ask us to join in that celebration. I'll ask you to help me celebrate Dominic Campbell. Now then, does this work? Do we work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. That's always a good start. Um, I think we should have another round of applause to ourselves. Congratulations on making it this far. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to start with a prelude. And at this point, it's always exciting. I have a vague idea of where we're going, but not always the complete method of getting there. So, a prelude. To increase compassionate community by prototyping and propagating creative practice which rewires individual neurons and systemic networks by facilitating desire paths using the joys of connectivity and disruptive objects which proliferate like coral. When you fall in love with your older self, you build a world you want your grandchildren to age in. So I'm going to talk about aging and creativity and community Brains, intelligence, and knowledge are not necessarily in that order. Uh, I am going to try and mark out for you what we are concerned with at Creative Aging International and in this area of practice that is changing all the time. I'm going to try and talk about creative practice and its roles, and also how, where that's evolving, how that's evolving. But before I start, because I'm a big believer in um, communal intelligence then I really want to know just a little bit about why you came along on a Monday night. I'm fascinated why people decide that this is the thing that they're going to go to, because obviously we are all the right people here, because we got here. <laughs> we're the right people in the room. So I just want a little bit of a sense of why we're the right people in the room. Um, let me think, how many of you, how many of you are interested in arts? Oh, that's excellent, great. How many of you are interested in aging? We're already ahead. Uh, how many of you are interested in your in systemic aging? Aging at a national level or the culture? Quite a lot, okay. Um, let me think what else. How many of you have a professional interest, work in, in some way, the area of, oh, too fast. The area of creativity? Okay, the area of aging. Okay, um, just quick things. How, how many of you in some format are academics? Excellent. How many of you are researchers in some other format? Okay, how many of you are creative practitioners? I love those people who go, yeah, we know this game, we're going to do all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me, is there, is, there, is there one particular thing, and let's keep them really short, so... so keywords or, or tweets. Is there one particular thing that you'd like to hear talked about this evening? Shout them out. Rites of passage. Well, oh, that's a nice one. Uh, T-E-S or G-H-T-S? <laughs> okay, keep going. Any more? Yeah. What was the last one? Healing? You have to kneel down for this bit. Any of the shy people in the back?
and I leave that as encouraging. Yeah. Okay. There was some more. <laughs> I like that one. Exuberance. Okay. Okay. Um, we might add as we go on. So, um, but it gives us a very big, broad field. Um, I tend to get very excited as I talk. So, if I talk too quickly, can you wave at me? Can I see? Can you wave at me from the back so I can check? I can see. Yeah, great. And I will try and slow down. Okay. When we start to talk about aging and we start to talk about creativity, all of a sudden, lots of issues pop up. Um, let's start with some headlines. So these are the things people are tend to be familiar with. Headlines about longevity and size of population. In the US, by 2050, uh, what is it, 89 people, 20% of the population will be over the age of 65. In Europe, uh, by mid-century, or before mid-century, 2030. Um, and the key point about mentioning these at the beginning is that longevity of experience is a whole new territory. It's historically unprecedented, it's unique. And the general conversation begins with the headlines and people say, well, that's 2030, that's 2050. Last week I was in Minneapolis. 20% of the population of the state of Minneapolis will be over the age of 65 by in 18 months' time. Okay? So, it's a whole new thing. And I think that beholdens us to be humble in our intelligence so that when we start to think about this new area of lived experience, we approach it humbly, and we think about how we learn both from the lived experience, from scientific or creative exploration or investigation, and how we try and fit those into one even equal playing field. On a good day, when I think everything's great, I think that old age might be a kind of common ground in time that we might all meet there and generate knowledge in some way. <coughs> so what do we know about old? Well, I think the more we discover, the more we search into it, the less we know. We know that it's, from my perspective, not a simple matter of chronology. To borrow from Ken Robinson, the educationalist, it's not about date of manufacture and date of obsolescence. And we know this is not the case, because if we start to think about the social determinants of health, the fact that in the city that I live in, depending on the zip code that I'm born in, I'll have a 10-year difference in life expectancy. If I'm born, I had an amazing experience where I, I got up in Dublin, I got on a plane, I traveled to South Africa, I got off the plane. And simply by taking that journey, I'd gone from being middle-aged to amongst the eldest of the population of South Africa. It's one thing to know it from a conceptual perspective. It's a completely different thing to embody it and understand what it feels like. So we know that the social determinants affect longevity, but they also affect the point at which we might become chronically ill, depending on illness. This might be to do with the type of life we live. It might be the environment that we live in. If we live in a war zone, we're going to get sicker than if we, if we live on the street, we're going to get sicker than if we don't. And for me, one of the things that starts to bring into play is this idea about how do we build a republic of care. So I borrow a little bit from John Tronto, a uh, feminist sociologist. And she talks firstly about when the idea of the republic is created, when Plato invents the idea of the public, he says there are two spheres. There's a domestic sphere and there's the public sphere. And care sits in the domestic sphere. She says, we're quite good at doing care to people. We sort of know how to do that. 
we're very comfortable with doing care to people. We're less comfortable with receiving care or going through the transition over life from one to another or holding the two together. Susan Pilstein, who founded the National Centre for Creative Aging uh, and did great work with Jim Cullen, also talks about old as the ability to live well with loss. She says, that loss might be, I can't get on down the stairs as quickly as I could. I can't eat the same food. Or it might be, I'm beginning to lose my circuit of friends. So the question, I think, when we start to think about old and aging, becomes about how do we live longer for better? But it also becomes about how do we change and unpick the stories that we've got. So when I go and I meet people, and we talk about aging, quite often they talk about all the top blue words. So I'll unpick some of these. It's interesting as I unpick them to also think about the gold words at the bottom. So at a conference on aging, people will talk about longevity. They will jump very quickly to talk about health. Old age is not a health condition. Straightforward, but it's so often the conversation about aging is always about health. But if we do think about health, one of the things that's interesting to think about is to look at the kind of institutions that we think are responsible for the maintenance or support of us with our health. So I was born in England. I was born under a national health service system. I live in Ireland where there's a two-tier system. And I can see that those big systems of health care are now trying to navigate their way through being institutions that were originally based on acute and moving towards chronic. So they are a black box health care system. So people go into the box, they get mended, and they come out. Yeah? It's Okay, so uh, the systems are based on a, on a box. You go in, you get mended, you come back to the environment you live in. It's fantastic if you have a broken bone. Extraordinarily good for heart disease, maybe, for that kind of cure. But if you are maintaining joyous living with a chronic condition, this black box may not be as effective as a system and a relation of care, with a community of care. And so that kind of leads to the other part of the healthcare conversation that happens so often, which is around well-being. How, even if I am living with whatever it might be, do I live well? How do I flourish? And quite often that conversation is educated by things like the social model of disability. That sometimes I am made, I am challenged by the environment that I'm in, not by the way that I am. Which links into selfhood. So there's often conversations about how do I, what am I? What am I? How do I change as I age? What, do I, what, am, what am I now? How am I different from my was before? And it becomes particularly pertinent, I think, when we start to talk about neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's or dementia. I think at the moment the figures are that eight out of nine brains will never have a problem. That uh, 50, 40 something percent of people over the age, age of 85 live independently well on their own quite happily. So we're not talking about everybody if you look at the data, but we are talking about significant populations. That's all the individual things, things that happen to an, a body, an individual. But what if we sort of step back a little bit and look at systemic change or, or what's happening within the culture, which is where I'm really most interested. So people would talk about life course, learning and change. If at the age of 50, I am pretty much guaranteed to have another 30 or 40 years of life, then how do I shape my life? This idea that we are born, we're educated at a school or education department, and then we go and have a productive life, and then we retire, becomes nonsense if we have another 30 or 40 years of longevity ahead of us. It becomes even more complicated when you think about the generational contracts. So in a European, and particularly in an English-British system, uh, the generation above me would have worked hard all their lives. They would have saved their money. They would have converted it into property. They would have had that as a gift to the next generation. So what's happening in a UK system is people are saying, well, 
if I'm going to be 90 and my kids are 70 and their kids are 50 and their kids are 30 and they have kids who are 10, why would I, I might need it, so why would I give it away? So this idea that there is a traditional way of aging and at a societal level, we know is beginning to undo and unpick and unravel in all sorts of interesting ways. We know that if we look, as I said before, at the inequality between countries, something really significant is starting to happen. And it's not only at the level of people living longer lives. In the UK, I was working in an um, alternative to daycare, creative alternative to daycare. And we had a woman who would come in with her care worker. This is London, okay? Europe, London. And her care worker lived in South Africa. She was on a four week cycle. So she would travel from South Africa to London to support this woman one on one, and then travel back home to South Africa. It was economically advantageous to her for her to do so. But the effect that that would have on herself, or on her family, or on her children, is complex. We can also see this in this country in, a, in, a, in all sorts of different ways, becoming the change happening in society as a result of longevity. And one way, I think, is that people who are worked hard, paid their taxes, they have their insurance covered, they're living well, they're living at quite a high level, and then somebody gets sick and a partner dies, and their economy gets challenged and their money gets spent. And so increasingly regular, it seems to be that people are dropping through the safety net that they think they've built through their life. And then I suppose the final part is the inequity between generations, this idea that's becoming very politically exploited, which is the idea that older generations have lived better than younger generations ever will. And in some ways that's a contrivance. We have a choice of how we live. We have a choice of what we do. Now, the reason that I've done all the blue ones and picked them up is because in all of those, they tend to be the dominant narrative. They tend to be what people talk about most. They tend to be the key issue on the conference paper. This bit down the bottom in gold is less visible. Assets, now, legacy, knowledge, time, resilience, teach, learn, joy, fun, and intelligent mischief. I know a whole heap of people 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 plus, and their lives are more covered by the gold banner headlines than anything in the top. So the dominant narrative and how it manifests itself is incredibly subversive. And I think about it, think about it for a second. How many of you, lots of you work in research? Yeah, so do exploration, yeah. How many of you are, and you are the experts because I know some of you guys, so you're incredibly knowledgeable. How many people do you know are looking at mischief, cheek, joy, generosity, fun, on the far side of 80? Anybody? Excellent. Can you tell me? I, I really genuinely want to know about that afterwards, So, because I'm really fascinated in that, why the, why the research narrative is so much about the negative, that it reinforces the, yeah, people are nodding, you've got me. Okay. So, when I go to, you know, gatherings to talk, the top part of the iceberg is usually what the conversations are about. Early diagnosis, patient voice, political influence, every piece of research I've ever read always wants more research, that's the nature of a sustained organisation. It's true, yeah. They don't talk about this bit. Value in gold, ageism, stereotyping and invisible inequality, fear and shame. If we don't talk about what is fantastic about old age, or fantastic and extraordinary and rich and vibrant about life on the far side of 50, then the only way that we might engage with it is like this. Our tendency would be to hide it, to put it away, to reinforce a negative cycle. We really have to do some work on thinking about aging positively which is where I reach for artists. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, so this is a poster from the internet. And uh, fact and fiction, as everybody knows, everything on the internet is true. And apparently, according to the internet, this is a poster from the 1930s. Beware of artists, they mick with all classes of society and therefore are the most dangerous. But I love it because what it points out is that artists are like connective tissue, okay? That they tend to go, really artists and journalists are some of the few people in society whose uh, passport is to just go and be really nosy. Everybody should spend a great deal of time being an artist because you can be incredibly nosy. You can knock on doors and they say, why are you here? And you say, because I'm an artist. I have a friend who ended up in Afghanistan in an army wandering around asking questions and people said, why are you here? He said, I'm the war artist. And they said, on you go. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Even at that level. But I also reach for this quote. Uh, so this is from Richard Smith in the British Medical Journal. Richard Smith was a GP, general practitioner, first point of contact, and he said, if health is about adaptation, understanding, and acceptance, then the arts may be more potent than anything that medicine has to offer. If the health is about adaptation, understanding, and acceptance. If aging is about adaptation, understanding, and acceptance. Okay? If we accept that we will change, because we are lucky enough to stick around for longer, then how do we navigate through that? So, having reached for artists, we then have to kind of have a little bit of a think about what kind. Were I doing this talk maybe 20 years ago, or maybe even 10, uh, people would have talked about, let me think, Matisse, I suppose, is a good one. And now I just have to think, did I get the right artist? Yeah. So we talk about late period, we talk about adaptation, we talk about uh, at the point where he becomes arthritic, then he adapts his style. But I'm particularly interested in contemporary practice. That's my bag. I'm interested in the art that gets made now in response to the environment that we're in. So I think about people like Simone Forti. You should go online and look at this. I didn't have time to kind of put it in, but it's there as a, as a Vimeo video. It's superb. Um, Simone Forti, Anna Halperin of this area, Carrie Mae Weems. Um, so these are all people who have been artists all of their life and continue to practice. Uh, but I'd also think about artists who explore aging as a concern, as a creative concern. Um, I'd also think about the role in the bigger cultural sphere of what happens when the Rolling Stones are still on tour. And I think about why that's possible for a blues band. Okay? One of the extraordinary things about artists is they do not retire. Okay? They don't get paid often, but they don't retire. So this idea that there are, through practice and through embodiment, they're also a sign of something else that's changing. I'm fascinated at the moment by what's happening with big music festivals and the age of the performers on stage. There's something really interesting happening because what's happening from that little segment of society is age is becoming more visible because it's normal. Um, but I also think about companies like this. So this is a photograph of uh, Dance Exchange based in Washington, uh, founded originally uh, by Liz Lerman. Um, it's continued with Carrie Meadows doing fantastic work. And the reason I think about this company is Liz made a decision very early on that her company would be diverse in as many senses as possible. It would have as many points of view on the creation of dance. And one reason for doing this was, she said, we are used as an audience to seeing someone who is 21 who can do this with their leg. We are not used to seeing a 95-year-old with a lifetime of experience in every move. How, as a director, do I put those on a stage equally so that you as an audience can navigate through that? She also says, Liz Lerman, that we have incredible hierarchies in creative practice. So we talk about the national, the regional, the local, the place down the road. We talk about, might be different, opera, jazz, country and western, 
me singing in the kitchen. <laughs> and people's experience is like this. She calls it hiking the horizon. Yeah? So this hierarchy, from a lived perspective, changes. It's important that we are humble and we have humility in how we gather and collect intelligence. So a, I could talk about loads of different artists, but I want to keep moving on. And I also want to show some art. So uh, I think it's just important to bring something into the room. So I'm going to play this while I take a little break. That sound is an oxygen tank. Try your best, but you don't succeed. When you get what you want, but not what you need. When you feel so tired that you can't sleep. Stuck in reverse. Tears come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace When you love someone and it goes to waste Could it be worse? Art's incredibly good at bringing lots of complicated information in a really short space of time. It works on an emotional level and an intellectual level. We know from research people make decisions because they emotionally decide and then they rationalize. It carries incredibly complex amount of information in a very short space of time. We could unpick that. It's also important to know that the Jung and Hart Chorus was founded by a guy that had been part of the Worcester group who needed a job and went to work in a soup kitchen or a lunch club with elders and got bored of just playing the piano and playing the songs that people thought that people should be listening to. And so he cheekily thought one day, what if I take a contemporary pop song and we see what happened when the elders sing it? And then he took the clashes lost in the supermarket and realized when you have someone with an early onset neurodegenerative condition, the lyrics of lost in the supermarket have a completely different meaning. He realized that the power and resonance and emotion that brings is important in all sorts of different ways, that it gives people a status that they may not otherwise have. That the form changes, that if we are to understand this new future life, forms have to change. That the dance that's made won't look the same as the dance made by a 21-year-old. That the way that we encounter it won't be the same. And maybe the ways that we think about it won't be the same either. So I have been trying slowly, incredibly slowly, to try and come up with different framings for what creative aging work has in common. This doesn't all mean it's fantastic or it's a way of hierarchy and praising one over the other. It's a way of trying to understand what's going on. And at the moment, and this might change next week, like my favorite top 10 albums, it might change tomorrow. Um, at the moment, it's this, that the good work, the interesting work for me, has individual choice. It listens. There is listening within the creative practice. There is empathy and exchange, however that works. 
which also means there's some understanding of power dynamics. There is genuine exploration, and it's disruptive. Genuine exploration quite often means that the person making it does not know where this is going. It might disrupt, but also the really good stuff repositions, connects, and convenes. And increasingly, I'm starting to think about rites of passage ritual. Uh, so what I'm going to do for the next part of this talk is try and unpick some of those for you a little bit. I'm going to do it with examples, because I think examples are the most interesting bit, and also because I am a creative practitioner, I'm a cultural producer. So I learn by making things, and then thinking about them, and then making some more. Um, individuality, agency, choice. Okay, I always think of this picture when I think about the, the choice piece. So choice could be something that you're able to do on the table on your hospital bed or something that you're able to do regardless of your circumstance. I think of things like reading a book, you choose to turn the next page, or writing a poem where you choose to organize the words in a new way. And I think it's best measured, if we're thinking about evaluation, by loss of time. So when it's really fantastic, is the bit where you suddenly look up and realize that you've forgotten to do the thing that you were meant to do two hours ago. Okay? When we think about evaluation, it's always interesting to think about that. And it's not a very big jump to go from thinking about agency to start thinking about works of companies like Performance Ensemble. So I could have used for this Performance Ensemble, which are a company that started in the UK uh, by a director called Alan Lydiard, who at the age of 66, at the point where he got a bus pass, free bus travel, said, OK, now I'm going to start a performance ensemble of people that will collectively make new work. And Alan has a long, rich history as a director. And he's interested in how people present their own story. So quite often life story work, I suppose. But he often begins his work by saying, by getting people to go through an exercise, which is, I am here, it is now and I'm okay. And when you think about what happens and when you watch what happens when people repeatedly tell their own story, how they navigate their way through their own life history, what's happening in a neuroplasticity way, what's happening in a bodied way, what's happening in the sense of what's my place in the role, then the role of an art form which is listening and genuinely empath empathic to the people that it's making work with, uh, is important and the people in that company some have been performers all of their lives some it might be their first time on stage but at the fifth telling or the sixth telling of their story I no longer know what they are I'm not sure we have a word for what that stage is um, I could have talked about relive Welsh company I could have talked about there are hundreds of companies beginning to work or who have built on a rich tradition which comes from all sorts of backgrounds about the telling of life stories. And as people start to tell life stories, the understanding of how people actually live changes. The company Quarantine talk about their work as realizing that behind every face on every street, there beats a life of infinite complexity. Love that. Behind every face on every street, there beats a life of infinite complexity. Um, Alan Lydiard, performance ensemble that company just starting at 66. We're inspired by a Japanese, famous Japanese director called Nina Gawa, who started a new company at the age of 85, I think, or eight, early 80s. Started a company called the Saitama Gold Company. To be a member of the Saitama Gold Company, it was an invitation that went off around Japan from Nina Gawa, who was a god of theater in Japan. And so people were invited to join the company, but they were very committed, and so he was looking for people who to join this company radically changed their lives at, at 70 and at 80. And uh, one of their shows starts with this. It starts with older people in fish tanks. I think there's 26 of them on stage. So the work doesn't look like you'd expect it to work. It's not always sweetness and light. Aidan Kelly, photographer in Ireland, decided to take photographs of older people with tattoos. Thought he would find sailors and people who had tattoos because they'd been to sea and was constantly proved wrong because there were so many women who had tattoos to mark a significant moment in their life, or had tattoos because they felt like it. 
at whatever age. Behind every face on every street, you meet a life of infinite complexity. And when that listening and being educated by what you're encountering enables the practitioner, the creative practitioner, whatever age they are, to move their practice, then I think we move into some really fascinating, rich new territory. Greenot Neal, Irish choreographer, says, as a choreographer, where the work is developed with the dancers and by them through them, each individual's input is very important. To have this luxury of working with such experienced and mature people is great for me because it's given me something I don't have. There's an enormous amount of learning, particularly in America, from the dancers of the Judson Church generation who, in my simplified way of telling it, choreographed their own bodies and simply continued to choreograph their bodies as they aged. And it's extraordinary what that has allowed. The number of people that I meet in the aging sector in, in, in America that came through that generation who have allowed form to change. This is the work of a company called Spare Tire. I think you can see the bubbles in the top left-hand side. It's a piece of theatre. Uh, each stage of this theatre is about touch and texture and tactileness. Um, it's made for and with and informed by people with degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's or dementia. It's performed quite often in care settings. So it's not only the form that changes, but where you will encounter the work that changes. This is the work of a Tasmanian company called Creature Tales. Creature Tales take carnivals into care homes. They bring risk into care homes. Uh, what you can see is a person with a moderate degenerative condition painting the belly of the dancer. What you can see in this one is a company that goes into a residential care settings and encourages people to fall. For those of you that work in care settings, it's like your worst nightmare. <laughs> Bunch of creative people came in here today and they encouraged people to fall over. Ah! They broke up the clock. Ah! They weren't finished by the time the meal was ready. Ah! <laughs> what they do is say, look, the structure that we built in order to encourage safety is also limiting life. Okay? Risk is part of living, people. The fact we made it here, fantastic. Okay, risk is everywhere. We take it away, we reduce. Um, project in a care home in, in Ireland lied very simply to remind me that uh, we found a residential care setting where lots of people knitted. There's a tradition of knitting amongst men and amongst women. We worked with a local charity. Items were knitted in the care home, they were sold to the charitable shop, and the money raised went to support people in great need. And so what that did was change the perception of the people in the residential care settings from being the most needy to being contributors. Not only the perception of the small town, but also their perception of themselves. If we want to stay healthy, we need to contribute, we need to be involved, we need to take risk, we want to be alive. This is part of the work of Antaliki. Um, based in South East London, of which more later. This began because uh, the 70, 80, 90 year olds that are leading that company now said, we are so tired of being invisible. When I go down the street on my motorized vehicle, people don't even look at me. There is research, I think, that, that after the age of 65, people don't get looked in the eye when they walk down the street. And so the simple solution to this was, okay, OK, Eileen, what we're going to do is we're going to put you in a bed outside and we're just going to leave you on the street. We're going to do it on market day first and we'll see what happens. So we have no idea what's going to happen. It's a genuine piece of exploration. And who knows? We'll, we'll just try it and see what happens. So we did. Uh, that's a police officer. Um, there are pieces, people at a sort of safe distance, keeping an eye. I, um, Rose is a, is a, what's she now? She's, she's 88, I think. She's an 88-year-old performer. Uh, on the first day that we did this, some youth, some teens, uh, went to the nearest place of the desk, which happened to be the library, and said to the people at the desk, uh, we'd like to report a crime. Uh, people are abandoning old people in our neighborhood. <laughs> Currently, David is working in Japan to make a Japanese version of this. What's interesting for me is I thought about trying to bring this to San Francisco. I think it wouldn't work. 
I think it would be invisible. Okay. Disruption doesn't happen in the same way everywhere. So this is a group uh, called Blow the Dust Off Your Trumpet Orchestra, which began uh, with me going to the National Concert Hall in Dublin and inviting them to start an orchestra for elders because they had youth projects, because they're a museum. But they didn't have education projects for elders. They didn't do the kind of thing that, that Ollie do, encourage people. It's Susan's great line that I love very much is, you know, the most radical thing I do is I ask a 97-year-old, what would you like to learn next? This began from there. It began from saying, let's start an orchestra in the concert hall. So the project ran for six months. And uh, then the, the concert hall thought it was a great thing, so they found resources to continue it. And then uh, they phoned me up and said, we've got a problem. The orchestra keep coming in. The members of the orchestra keep coming in. You should use the photocopier. They just walk into the office of the concert hall and use the machinery. And uh, that's very disruptive. It's not great. We, like, we want to get on with our work, and they're coming in. And when we say, Look, do you, what are you doing? They say, we're the orchestra of the National Concert Hall, which they are. Which led to a really interesting conversation between the members, adult members of this orchestra, and the institution in which they were an orchestra, where we said, well, what is it you want to learn? And why is it OK to do that? These are adults. <laughs> these are people who have been advisor to the Irish prime minister. One of these people was a press officer for the Irish premier. Okay? These are not foolish people. If they're disrupting, they're doing it for a really deliberate reason. People said, we want to play on the stage of the place that we saw when I was a wee girl. It's lovely to play there. It's always been a ambitions. People said, I want to be the best musician I can possibly be. People said, uh, I want to explore new music and temporary music. Other people said, we want to play on the railway station on a Friday afternoon. Public space and ageing is incredibly important, which brings me to the final third. When we work with people who are anywhere the far side of 30, we join a story in the middle. There's a great explanation of Russian novels which says the story starts, the characters emerge through the first page, and we follow them, and then they might have a dog, and we follow the dog, and then that dog follows somebody else, we follow them, and then the characters disappear to the back of the page, and we get this much. Creative practice with people over the age of 30, 40, 50, 60, is always about starting a story in the middle. But that story isn't just about the individual, it's about the choices that we have within society. It's about the opportunities that we have, it's about systemic aging, it's about the structures that have built around the individual and the way that we perceive aging. So that brings me to the ritual piece. I, part of my background is as a carnival practitioner. I used to be a maker of carnival costumes in the Caribbean and in London, and I was really fascinated by what happens when someone wears a mask. So, when you work with small children, and you dress them up as kings and queens, and you invite them to process through the middle of a city, like Dublin when I ran St. Patrick's Day, they walk through the middle of the city as kings and queens. They own the place that they're in. This fantastic thing happens where you assume the costume of the person that you're becoming. And I think that one of the things that I found most fascinating about carnival in somewhere like New Orleans or Brazil, or particularly really in the Caribbean, is what that had maintained over generations. What this idea of the imaginative opportunity had managed to retain until the point that it became the lived reality. Uh, Anne Basting, creative aging practitioner extraordinary, runs a company called Time Slips, makes creative projects in residential care settings. And she says, we take reality and we put story on top of it. And it opens up this gap in the middle. And that's where change builds from. So this idea of the imaginative possible, that we can dream it in some other way, is incredibly rich and important to the work that we do. And then the third part, I suppose, of the right and ritual and creative piece 
is that in Carnival there is the potential for everybody to be involved at whatever level works for them. So you can be the most extraordinary practitioner ever, or you can make something for yourself, a costume for yourself, which might be made out of whatever you've got in your kitchen and your imagination. So those six pieces lead me into the work that I'm doing now, which is all about contemporary celebration. Contemporary festivals are the place that we go and experiment. We go and try new song. We go and try new food. They have a function within the societies that we live in here uh, in terms of portraying new ideas, telling new stories. They overcome threshold hesitation. People will often go to a festival to try something out that they wouldn't do in any other part of their life. It's a, it's a moment in time for trying out the new. Um, they are extraordinarily valuable at connecting people, particularly ones that happen outside, because you can bump into the public space, or the road is closed, so you have to divert your car, and you know that there's something going on. Uh, I think the best ones are porous, so I will get into that in a minute, really, rather than now. Festivals are also becoming an economic and a data engine. So something like Lollapalooza generates enough money to keep itself going. Burning Man, everybody knows about. Uh, the thing that I always forget to say, and my friend B reminds me, is that I need to mention that festivals are fun. <laughs> the celebratory part is really important. And so I took that and applied it to a celebration of creativity and ageing in the Irish Republic, which when I began in 96 was... Uh, 52 events, when I finished in 2013, was 3,500. So 3,500 events made by 700 partner organisations involved uh, about 112,000 people, which is 20% of the population over the age of 65 in the Republic of Ireland. So it's made collaboratively. What it does is what any festival does. It commissions, it uh, gets people to make things. It sends artists to work in difficult zip codes with people that might get older earlier. It starts to play with narrative. It produces. It works through partnership. It invites people in. It hosts a celebration. And the organisations that are involved make very different types of artwork depending on their context. So a creative project that is generated by or in a hospital setting is not the same as one generated by or for a creative national cultural institution. But what the festival enables is that all of that can sit in the same receptacle, can be held together. And in the same way that people can look at Lizzie's dancer, we can look at this work next to each other and we can start to think, if we are humble in how we generate knowledge, how do we fit all of that together to really understand the puzzle of aging? And I think the way that we start to put that together is we start to think about Aging is a cultural issue. I felt emotional and privileged to be involved in something so immensely positive. Bieltana makes me believe that people are good. Bieltana, by the way, is the Irish word for spring, for rebirth, for a time of renewal. And it was very deliberately chosen by Age and Opportunity, the charity that founded Bieltana, because they were so tired of photographs of hands and falling leaves and solo piano when it's C chord, minor chord. They said, no, it's, we have to start to play with the stories and the narrative. We have to undo that. Where do we begin? And so as the festival built over time, uh, lots of extraordinary things happened. Uh, I'm going to touch on this, which was uh, in uh, 2006, the Irish economy tanks. It drops through the floor. The festival has begun to expand. Lots of people are getting involved. Lots of people usually means lots more money. We need more money to build more resources and we're just going to get bigger and bigger. Economy stops, we have a problem, I think, as festival director. And so we had a conversation about this and realised that there were lots and lots of choirs in Ireland and lots of uh, active retirement groups and maybe what we could do is a gift. We could invite a gift. We could ask people, did, did they fancy getting up on the last Sunday in May at dawn, which is 4.30 in the morning, and singing on a beach. And to our surprise, some people said yes. And so we worked with a group of people in one part of the country on one event, and it was lovely, and everybody had a good time. We'd finish work at 9 o'clock in the morning. But actually, the experience of getting up 
of making a choice over how you spent your day had had significant impact. And so this grew over the next while. Uh, I've said before, but those are my, I think that's what a revolutionary outfit now looks like. I think people used to go to the hate and go, those clothes, that's what you wear if you're a bit punky and a bit revolutionary. Now I think it's like sensible shoes and raincoats. <laughs> we have to change the narrative and the understanding in all sorts of ways. Um, one of the people that got involved in this, Dawn Chorus Project, uh, said, uh, we don't want to do Dawn, we want to do it later. And because the festival is porous, we said, that's great. When? Well, like nine o'clock. Sure, okay. Uh, we want to involve the local school kids. They're gonna scatter petals on the river. Sure, your event. So there's this negotiation between the initial idea and its manifestation in place. People are starting to own it. We're going to involve the local fire brigade. They're gonna make rainbows. So I went for a look and a chat and he had the local fire brigade in full uniform was standing by the side of the river trying to make the perfect rainbow <laughs> with their hose. All these different groups in the town had become involved. And one of the reasons they'd become involved is because the Irish economy had tanked. And the role of elders in that society was incredibly important for community cohesion because elders had already lived through a tanking economy several times and were able to say, economy in that sense is only one measurement of the value of a life the value of a community. Getting up early, singing by water, is incredibly important. There is an evaluation. The festival goes on, I left in 2013. Uh, it does incredibly good things. They are popping up in other parts of the world and I'm trying to help them to do that. But what I'm also trying to do is marry the festival piece with something else. So that's something else I can tell best through illustration. So uh, this is uh, Meet Me at the Albany. It's the work of a company called Entelechy Arts and uh, the work of an art centre called the Albany uh, and also the work of a civic, a local authority, the civic institution. It began because the local authority said, we know that as the money reduces from central government, uh, we're not going to be able to do what we're legally obliged to do, which is care for older people and reduce, remove the bins. So we need to find a different kind of collaboration in this crisis that we now face. And the crisis is partly caused by the perception of what happens because there's ever longer lived people, this need, this challenge of older people. So the art centre, creative arts company in Teleki, and also a transport organisation came together and they made a day club for elders in this particular part of South East London. And sometimes people make things like this, and sometimes they make things like this. <laughs> they make all sorts of artwork. This is an advert for daycare. <laughs> Change the narrative. This is the latest advert. Now, is that the kind of club you'd want to go to? <laughs> okay. If I invited you to an event for 70-year-olds called the Old Something, would you want to go? <coughs> yes. Okay, I get the yes. Okay. But what this does is change that. What it also does... So those people in that group are very much the leaders of what gets made on a Tuesday. Tuesday works like a heartbeat. Um, it's a regular dropping club, it's like an arts group for elders, and the elders that come into that group come because they are recommended in by different agencies in that geographic area. So they might come in because they've had a stroke, and we've a relationship with the stroke department, and they say there's this guy, he's had a stroke, he's gone home, we might want to get involved. Uh, they might come through adult social care teams, they might be self-referred, they saw the posters, that looks like a bit of a laugh, we might go and try that. Uh, they might be suggested by their family and friends or they'll come through mental health. The red dots roughly are the number of participants. I'm going to use that word to start with. The green dots are roughly the number of volunteers. The blue dots are artists. After three years, I think the dots are kind of irrelevant. I don't know who is who anymore. What happens is this. It's like a health path. So somebody is home alone. They've had a stroke. They're depressed. And people only ever talk to them about their health. 
How are you feeling? Are you all right? How's your medication? Okay. They join the group, and after a while, they find something that's interested to them. So we, this is a particular guy who, who got interested in poetry because somebody spent a lot of time saying, let's reorganize the words. And he went, yeah, I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, just. And then he read one out in public. And because he read one out in public, he felt good. Yeah, he was praised, praised, you feel good. And so then he went on, he had a book of poems printed. He now gone on tour with a spoken word night. So this guy is no longer the stroke victim guy. He's the poet guy. Okay? If aging is about adaptation, resilience. So what we've done now is expand that across the borough. It doesn't just happen in one place. It's now happening in two. We've come up with other projects which are much smaller, but we think of them as little joiny bits, like a constellation of creative practice. So there is a film group which is led by young kids, 16-year-olds, in their estate, their housing estate, which uh, they bring their elders to see film, and they might show 10 minutes of the film and then stop it and have a conversation about it, or make popcorn, or learn the dance, or the song. There are artists in residence programs in uh, sheltered accommodation units, uh, and there's all sorts of other little pieces popping up. You don't really need the details, you just need the sense that it's appearing all around this geography. Okay? And what's happening is people are beginning to make their own connections between groups. So it's beginning to build a very small, small R Republic of Care. It's beginning to be the imaginative change. For the last two years, I've been an Atlantic fellow for a, a fellow with the Global Brain Health Institute um, between Trinity College in Dublin and UCSF here. And it's given me a chance to look at how this all joins together, to learn about the neuroscience of empathy and positivity and all, and to say, look, that thing that happens when Ron gets praised for being a poet, I now know what that's doing to the inside of his head. I know that that thing that we know about small children if I shout at them and scream at them, they will grow up in a certain way. But if I praise them and nurture them, they will grow differently. It applies at all stages of our lives. So, maybe ageing is common ground. Maybe we can build a better future. Maybe all of these challenges really do need a festival. Because it makes visible, it brings things out into the public, it enables people to tell stories. They can tell stories about their health, they can educate, they can entertain. If they entertain, they're making content. Content makes media possible. If you've got media, then you can always get commerce, because commerce will pay for attention. With media and attention, you can engage public authorities, you can start to engage transport systems in different prototype ways, you can start to connect national agencies, things like libraries. You can bring schools in and research, and that's what we've been doing. The festivals that we make sit at the middle of this complex relationship between, I suppose, commercial entities and cultural ones and activist ones and health ones and mavericks. And the festival becomes the place where all of these can connect. What's happening at an individual level, but also at a sy systemic societal level, is really this this kind of, it's behavioral change, it's behavioral psychiatry model, where people get curious and are inspired. What is that thing? That's amazing. And then, if they're engaged, and if they're given the opportunity to do something for themselves, they want to show it off. It works for small children and adults. It works for everybody. Okay, anybody got a child? Anybody had children? Okay, any of you with children had them learn an instrument. Okay, do you remember that bit where they're learning the instrument and they never stop? And they, that's the show-off piece. But it also works for institutions. So, uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the Aging Well Network, the, the Age Friendly Network, is working between cities in exactly the same way. Yeah? Portland is an age-friendly city. Uh, San Francisco is an age-friendly city. Ignored if I'm shaky if I'm wrong. It is, yeah. Uh, so cities want to have that badge. They want to be able to say, hey, we learned how to do that thing. Now we can do it. And so this is what we're doing with our work at the moment. Is we are looking for those partners to play with. We're creating a play, a space of play, a ludic place. We're t creating a temporary moment in time where we're saying, 
you know those problems that you've been talking about for ages that you've 30 years you're not getting any further well actually we can come at them a different way we know that you're in a really busy really pressured environment where you're constantly dealing with the crisis of old age but let's just take a little bit of time and we can glue these organizations and institutions and behaviors in together in a different way and so this last year this year no this year we did a one day deep dive with some of the people in this audience called creating a new old san francisco and we looked around the city for fantastic things that are already here and we gave them a platform and then we brought in some of the people who are also here in the audience and said do you know about these people who are living 100 miles 200 miles down the road they're also fantastic and maybe if you talk to each other another thing would happen and next year we'll try and build on that for a longer and deeper engagement and so the festivals have really three strands they have a strand which is about show like when we saw the video where it affects you emotionally they have a strand which is about tell like a traveling university where you get the chance to look at an issue engaging that's specific to your city or might be more generalized and they have these other spaces which are prototype projects projects where we knit together organizations that may not have worked together before or might work together in a new way and gradually what we're trying to do is to build a touring network of these around the states maybe around the world where great ideas from one place can exist in another place or can be transferred between places because we know that this isn't useful actually this works because people's experience is this and all great aging practice is geographically quite small one of the things that happens is our geography shrinks as we age um, but I'm going to end with two more slides one is this one um, if I'm not careful the last piece makes it sound very instrumentalized we do this and then we do this and then that happens and then we know where we're going I don't know where we're going um, I try to be as humble in my own practice as I ask other people to be and I use this to remind myself to talk of miracles it is a miracle that we get to live longer it is extraordinary what might we do with it might we be able to talk about it in the way that I think of Kintsugi Kintsugi is pottery made uh, by reassembling broken pottery where the cracks the glue is gold and so those areas that we break maybe those are the areas where we also are most precious and most shine if we can make a society that works for people who are fragile and broken can we make a society that works for all of us what kind of old do you want to be? What kind of world do you want to grow older in? Thank you. I have no idea of the time, sorry. Lost track completely. I, uh, if you want to hang around, if you want to leave, that's absolutely fine. You, like, I don't know how long I've gone on for. I, do we have a little bit more time? Yeah? I can invite questions. I think we have a mic. Do we have a mic? Yeah. We do have a mic. Yeah. So I, I can field them from up here because I can see you better than you can see me, maybe. Um, and uh, what we might do, because that's an awful lot of information to filter. So the first question is, is there any of these that I didn't get through? So there's a question up there. If you wait for the mic, it just means that because we're recording this, you know the rule. Thank you. No worries. We started with a whole list of topics, and then when you mentioned San Francisco, where I work, it reminded me of the word continuity. Con the, and you mentioned that the theme, the continuity of generations, but it's really being lost around the Bay Area. It's in crisis yeah. because of that. I'm sure someone must have mentioned it in your talks, but if you'd like to talk about it. I can it. touch on that for a moment. Well, can I take two or three bits and then I can tie them all off if I can? Is there another, any other? So um, continuity and, and generation, maybe down the 
middle of the um, I've had an opportunity this last year to work with some university students that were seniors and some older adults on a project and as much as I hate it I, sp I still find that the students have this amazing stereotype of older adults. Um, I will give you just one short example. It was about, the project was about things to do with walking. I won't go into it, but. And they started out asking me if the older adults they would be working with all had Velcro on their shoes. Yeah. And I was just really taken aback because I thought we had progressed further than that. Yeah. What are you finding, and how are you dealing with that? Okay. Continuity, that lovely surprise. One more. Can, can you, can you answer a question? Oh, I'll collect, sorry, I'll collect, and then we can try right, and figure yeah. out. <coughs> um, one of the things you said that I thought was uh, particularly brilliant was um, starting in the middle and how much of us how many of us here are trapped at beginnings and endings anticipating something we'll never get to and leaving behind something we can't return to how do you get to the middle yeah uh, I think I should take another one I have a sense can I just take one more Okay, no, you just twitch thing. Okay, when they used to talk about the alternative people, they would say, that sounds fantastic, that festival's great for my auntie, mom, granny. Okay, not me. So the first thing I think we have to do is we have to do it for ourselves. Yeah, we really have to kind of sit down and go, how am I doing with this aging thing? Am I creating a narrative of myself which is in itself ageist? Am I limiting what I might become? Or am I rejecting what I might be becoming? First thing. Second thing, continuity. Uh, <laughs> in my more grandiose moments, I sometimes think of what I do as uh, gluing together the ends of the Industrial Revolution. So, it sounds a bit extreme. What did you do this year? Oh, well, I glued together the ends of the Industrial Revolution one. <laughs> okay, so uh, why that? Because uh, the concept of aging is an Industrial Revolution model. Not only is it about date of manufacture and date of obsolescence, we'll work and then we'll retire. It also has these other things which are very much connected to the Industrial Revolution. So, um, Industrial Revolution model would include things, industrialization includes that, uh, lots of raw materials is reduced to do one thing spectacularly well with a huge amount of waste. Yep. Um, and f or the other thing that the Industrial Revolution did was it moved, uh, it, it, it broke up families. Okay, so people started to travel for work. They moved around country or countries. They went to where the work was, they went to where the city was. So there's a really interesting thing happening, or about to happen, in places like, like uh, in places where there's rural aging, and, and the cities aren't having the same experience. So the need to connect individual life story with the fact that this is the story of our wider community is I think one of the challenges and one of the reasons I try and play with a festival model and the marketing of the festival and the story that the festival tells and its dissemination and its media. And loosely that connects, I think, with this idea about we're always in the middle of a story. It, there's a, it, it's, it, I've had great fun over the last month of running around cities and talking to people and they say, oh, in an American culture, yeah, that must be particularly difficult, aging, because it's such an independent, culture and I've thought about that quite a bit and I know I, I met Annie Proof the writer a long time ago I brought her to Dublin to do a presentation 
and to talk about her work. And she said, what would you like me to talk about? And she said, would you like me to talk about the fact that the American cowboy is an Irish man's myth? <laughs> yes, please. So she did. And she said, it's an Irish man's myth because people arrive, not just Irish men, but she wanted to be disruptive. And as they travel through the country and they settle and they take over land, what they do is they replicate what they had inherited in their country of place, country of origin. So they, they, they own land, they buy cattle, and that whole way of thinking starts to affect the political structure. So you have the individual, you have the system that builds around them, and then you have the bigger system that builds around them. It is possible, if we look at different stories of America, to find as many stories of community, connection, cohesiveness, collaboration. Give me some more Cs. You can do that in this city. And Paul, sitting up there, journalist, writes about this stuff all the time. Paul Clayman. Uh, Susan, when she did a talk for us in January, <coughs> talked about, in the Bay Area, the Grey Power Movement, but also about, uh, you, know, there are those, you know that those communities exist. The fact that their stories are invisible is a mechanic. We need to be able to raise those stories up. And in doing that, there are so many other ways of being, so many other stories, so many other points of view that will come with it if we do it properly. Um, okay, I'm sensing tiredness. One of the, you know, it's difficult to sit in a dark room for ages, isn't it? Um, uh, I'd take some more questions. I'm gonna, yeah, go on. This is the fun bit. This is the bit where I really have to think on my feet and go, did I answer the questions? I, I'll give you a chance if I didn't answer it afterwards to come back. And uh, Go on, please. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, something that I've kept coming back to and what you've addressed in bits and pieces is um, the way that the money passes from hand to hand in our society has maybe affected how we experience aging and death and fear of those things. And I'm wondering about the way that you put on these festivals and these other things, or there's ways that you are, are you actively trying to disrupt the economics that surround aging and death, which I think create a lot of the fear? Because um, that really feels like to me like the ground level. One of the reasons I'm interested in aging is this thing about the potential that it's a place where we all meet. Okay, is it common? Can it be common ground in time? And when I started ages ago, I just thought everybody would end up there. And then as I <laughs> became a little bit more educated and a little bit less naive, I realized that not everybody gets there at the same time. But it's still possible to think about it as common ground in time. And I can illustrate that in a couple of different ways. Uh, so, so one of the ways is uh, what becomes important for, okay, simple thing, first thing, uh, the research shows that people are happiest, self-identity of happiness, in early age and in late age. Yep. So it's kind of interesting because it's not the story that we keep telling. It really isn't. Um, the second piece is about geography. So um, so maybe the story, if, if it's possible, if people, if the data says people are happy and we're not getting that story, then maybe a lot of the other stories are not true either. So next week, I go to work with Anne Bastings on a project that she's doing in a series of care homes in Kentucky. And Anne and I have been talking as peer mentors for a long time. The project she's doing is creating uh, a piece of theatre across care homes. So there are eight of them, I think. And what she's interested in is this layering of story onto the building. You know, So you use the institution a certain way. If we change the story of place, then we open up this gap. But I got interested in it because she said, some of the towns that we work in, the healthcare is supporting people to put their family member in at a certain point. It's commercially driven. But the town, the school public system is so underfunded that kids from that school are using the care home for their art materials. And I thought, that's really interesting. Is that a bit like what's happening in South London, 
where the care home or the creative center is becoming a different kind of center of community. And if you carry on with that, I wonder, and I don't know, what's happening to the limit of people's empathy? So I care for my vulnerable, frail adults, and I can't manage them on my own. And luckily, I can afford to put someone in a home that's supporting them, and I'm supported, and we can manage our way through that. But at what point does my empathy end? So what I'm wondering, and I don't have an answer to this, it's a question, it's an open-ended question, is can the can mass aging, can aging at scale work as a sort of social acupuncture? Or a, a, I think of it as Tai Chi. Can it move the weight of a society? So we talk about aging at scale as a terrible problem. What if we start to think about it as an opportunity? What opportunities lie within it? Never waste a crisis. So in this crisis, what potential is it opening up? You know, never underestimate it. The cracks, it's where the light gets in. If rural Minneapolis, in a year and a half's time, has 20% of its population over the age of 65, that doesn't mean they're all infirm. That just means they're over the age of 65. So what kind of community are they going to build? What might happen there? Who are they going to vote for? There's a lady in the middle of the front row. There's two, actually. The yeah, last two. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. <laughs> Berkeley's different. <laughs> um, and I haven't lived here a very long time, but I've lived around the Bay Area for a long time. And um, I think what I've been thinking about as you are talking about this uh, that I might like to share is that uh, patterns, invisible and kind of in intentional and unintentional patterns are going through my mind maybe just in a way that, I, that they do when I, as I'm an artist, you know. And I work with older people in the arts um, as an artist. And I think that um, there's a... Um, uh, you know, we have this, like you're talking about how young people and old people, it's hard for them to find each other and to see each other uh, from both ends. And I think that it, I think the challenge is, and I'm an academic sort of person myself in a lot of ways, is, is how, to, um, how to move past the patterns and the definitions and the structures of, uh, of um, uh, this way of speaking about things that is very erudite, I don't know. It's like, you know, smart people. And yeah. it's good. And, and, and yet, when you're actually working with someone one-on-one -on -one in that moment, no matter how old they are or how smart they are or how, how uh, you know, limited or unlimited or uneducated, whatever, it's like all, those stu all that stuff falls away. Everything falls away and you are, you are it's in a it's like you go to this place with, with in, the, in the arts, which I think is why we like to work in creative arts. So I'm just kind of, um, yeah. does that make sense? That makes lots of sense. And if I, I'll take the lady behind you as well, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Well, I was going to s speak on the very same thing about collaborating um, the different age levels so that we can give the gift of the wisdom of the elders to the youth who could really use a knitting lesson. So in a lot of environments that are experimental, it seems dangerous to mix these things because of protocols. But I think the more passion I have for this creative aging field, the more I realize the training of youth is so beautiful for this work. And we know there's going to be a great um, need for this type of compassionate youth who come and get trained, it could be a skill that we don't even know how big it is. Or don't have a name we, for. It's, well, I like this sort of space you made that's empty, which you don't have the name for, but I think that what happens is it's healing. When you get symbiosis between two things and you didn't expect them, you just experiment. It's like cooking. Mm. You never knew it was gonna taste so good. It was just, the last two things you had in your refrigerator. 
So I like to think that the youth really are the answer. And we do need to train them, and we need to have those people in the middle who know a lot more from their viewpoint to, you know, to facilitate. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. I'm going to do touch on three things, and this will wrap it up nicely, I think. 95-year-olds uh, quite often will say, I'm not old. Eileen's old. She's 96. 70-year-olds will say it about 8-year-olds. 5-year-olds say it about 6-year-olds. So it's if we start to think of a spectrum, it's a lot easier. Uh, we just finished a project with a museum in Dublin called the Chester Beatty. It's called the Chester Beatty Museum now. Um, and the museum had been struggling with and working very hard to make itself accessible to people who had Alzheimer's or dementia. And so we ran a project, I was able to support a project and make a project happen where an investigative team was founded, which was led by people with a diagnosis, living with a diagnosis and their carers, and the docents and the senior staff and the educators, and in some cases the security guard and the gardeners. And they looked at gardens in the museum and they looked at gardens outside and they went as an investigative group to look at these different things and then they made an exhibition of it. And the most extraordinary thing from that project is that one of the heads of the education department said this brilliant thing. She said after about three weeks, Alzheimer's was no longer in the center of the room. It's an awful lot easier to make a museum for Brian and Eileen than it is for this thing. And then the third part is, an, is a development on that really and it kind of brings me back to the beginning. Um, so with this group of elders in London, which we've been working with for a long time, through Entelechy and through the Albany, uh, we're looking at the next piece of where this goes, because we don't know where it goes. And so uh, at the moment, we're trying to develop this program, which will be called, which will be an investigation, which they will lead. But they will lead a whole pile of different investigative teams who work through different types of investigations. So they might be sociologists, or they might be working through a different type, a particular type of evaluative lens, or they might be visual evaluators, or they might be looking from a healthcare system. We don't know, but the elders will lead it. And what they will lead an investigation into is how do we live now? And I think that is where we wrap it up. Thank you for staying.